Okay, so what I'm going to do today is uh, give you an overview, at least this morning, give you an overview of GTSPP and a uh, bit of the history, some of the infrastructure that it support is supported uh, through the program, how we manage the data, uh, how the platforms are identified, and there's two different systems. There's a real-time way of identifying platforms. A platform is a ship, a buoy, uh, a moored platform, an Argo float, uh, whatever it is. Those are called platforms in the real time. In the delayed mode, sometimes people will use ship or vessel or float or whatever. But they're all the same things, but they are named. They have different ways of identifying them in the two different systems. And then um, at the end of this session, just before coffee, well, a little bit before, Charles will show you how to download some data from the, uh, the server at NODC. So some acknowledgments. These are uh, some of the folks who have uh, contributed to GTSPP. Some were in at the beginning. Some have joined, uh, become more active as the program has gone on. Um, so we won't try to uh, handle it all. GTSPP is a joint program between the WMO, which is the World Meteorological Organization, which is a collection of all the meteorological centers in the world, and the IOC, which I hope you're all familiar with. And the intention of GTSPP is to deliver the highest quality data as fast as possible uh, uh, to, to users, and that at the highest resolution available. And we'll, we'll uh, show you a bit about that later on. The wiring diagram doesn't matter very much. JCOM, or GTSVP, is, um, is reports both to uh, IODE as an IODE program and also to JCOM, uh, the Joint Commission on Oceanography and Marine Meteorology, which is a joint program of WMO and IOC. Don't worry about it all. <laughs> So it started in about 1990. We, we started operations. There were a, a couple of years before that we started discussions about what GTSPP could and should be. And uh, it came, started, the real-time component started in 1990. The delayed mode was a little bit later, maybe 1991. Um, and then we operated as a pilot project at first because we wanted to just get up and running and see how it would work. And then in 1996, we became a, a permanent program of IODE. And, uh, and here it says IGOS. IGOS was a forerunner to JCOM, a similar kind of program within the oceanographic domain. Um, the objectives are these, to provide timely and complete data and information of ocean temperature and salinity, and to implement data flow monitoring to improve the capture and timeliness of the real-time and delayed mode. So this was an important way for us to know how well we were meeting our timeliness and quality and, and completeness issues in the, in the program. So to do that, in fact, we had to carry within the data format, as you'll see later today, a lot of extra information. And you might wonder why we're doing it but it was because we wanted to be able to track data as it came through the whole system. To improve and implement agreed uniform quality control procedures and duplicates management. And, and I would say as part of that too, we tried to make use of as many standard code tables, vocabularies that existed already. So uh, within the old IGOS program, for example, they had a set of quality flags that would qualify. You could attach to a data point and say, it's good, it's not so good, I don't know if I believe it, but it might be okay, and then one that was bad. And so we just adopted that flagging scheme rather than invent a new one. And we adopted various other kinds of code tables, so platform identifiers. Um, tables for variables and so on, as you'll see a bit later. So that was an important part of it too. And to facilitate the development and provision of data analyses, products, and so on. And GTSPP data does contribute to a variety of programs now. Um, 
certainly all the data ends up in the World Ocean Database. Uh, much, uh, all of the data ends up in the French Coriolis and Mercator systems. Um, the the um, ECMWF, the uh, European Center for Mid-Range Weather Forecasting, it gets a download of the GTSPP data as well. Uh, so there are all these kinds of feeds. There's other ones as, as well, and you'll you might hear about during this. So Australia, Canada, France, and USA are the the most active partners. Um, Australia it runs the del delayed mode data assembly and quality control. So there are different levels of quality control that we initiated within the program. Uh, it starts off with what we call data center quality control. So those are the initial steps that we go through when data come to us to try to weed out most of the, the uh, large and serious errors. And then later on with the real-time and delayed mode, it goes through what we had called during the uh, World Ocean Circulation Experiment days the scientific quality control where the researchers actually uh, have a look at the data and clean up the other remaining problems that are in it. And so those delayed mode come in to replace the versions that we would have in the, uh, in the data file. Canada's role, my role when the, in the program was to do the real-time data assembly, the quality control, duplicates management. Uh, Japan has a data product center now for the North Pacific who are helping to generate some possible products from it. Uh, France does uh, some data, uh, delayed mode data assembly and quality control as well, kind of analogous to what Australia does. And then the USA runs the, the database and we called it a continuously managed database because data are continually coming into it. Old, old versions are replaced by newer versions that are of higher quality or higher resolution. Um, and so it's a, it's a very active and uh, a very active database. And we'll talk about some of these, uh, the data matching and so on uh, that comes later. And of course, those countries and other countries uh, contribute profile observations of all kinds. So GTSPP gets data from the Ship of Opportunity program, which is uh, an international program run uh, through JCOM, or coordinated through JCOM, I should say, um, from uh, the various moorings in the open ocean, the equatorial mooring, mooring arrays such as uh, uh, Tau or Parata or Rama. They also contribute from the Argo uh, system from the ships of opportunity who largely uh, deploy XBTs, from research vessels who may deploy XBTs or XCTDs or drop or do CTDs uh, as well. Um, essentially, GTSBP tries to bring all of these data sources together. So. During the World Ocean Circulation Experiment from 1990 to 2002, GTSPP was the coordinating database uh, data assembly center for the what was called the Ocean Thermal uh, Data Assembly Center. So that was essentially the, the uh, profiles in the upper ocean because there were very few deep profiles. And that ran for about a decade. And um, you may have seen there was a... a DVDs, I guess, produced at the end of that program, which was a consolidation of all the various WOS uh, components. So there was an ADCP, there was a uh, tides, there was a upper ocean thermal, there was I don't know, it was there was about more than half a dozen different components in WOS. Uh, so as I said, we uh, support the the Argo program. Um, the climate variability and predictability, the CLIVAR program is also uh, makes use of, of uh, GTSPP, Ship of Opportunity, and the World Ocean Database. So, the infrastructure of GTSPP. The, the first part of it, the real-time data. Now, real-time in oceanography, international oceanography, is defined as any data that appears within 30 days of the observation. 
And it was 30 days because in the old days, telecommunication systems weren't very good, and people working on board ship didn't have the sophistication of the computers we have today. And so it sometimes took a matter of days to um, prepare the data. And then you had to send it ashore. The first time I went on a cruise, the radio operator had to send it ashore by a radio uh, system. Very tedious. Nowadays, of course, it's all through satellite links and everything goes very quick. So zero to 30 days. Much of the data that comes in in real time now does, in fact, arrive within 24 to 48 hours of the profile being collected. The, it comes ashore through various systems. Some is uh, coastal radio stations from the ships at sea or from the platforms. A lot of it is through Inmarsat satellite systems, uh, some through Iridium, which is a, another kind of uh, satellite system, and uh, down to a ground station. And then the data at that ground station are prepared in a format, a data format that allows it to be inserted onto this global telecommunications system, the GTS. And this is a system run by the uh, WMO, by the MET centers, and only MET centers are allowed to be directly connected. So the first thing we had to do in Canada when we were, were going to run the real-time oceanography component was to get a connection to our local, to our Canadian MET center. So we set that up and they take off the data that's circulating on this GTS. They remove it from, the, or take a copy off and send it to us every 15 minutes. So they bundle up these data put it into a package and relay it down a communication system to us in, in Ottawa every 15 minutes. So every 15 minutes a bundle of data arrived, whatever was circulating. So that's the basis the real time where the real time data come through. And then there is work done at the, our place and, and IODE centers contribute their delayed mode data and again, all into this continuously managed database. So the work that takes place on the real-time data is done three times a week. And uh, we look at, we reformat the data coming off the GTS into the uh, GTSPP internal data format, add in the metadata that we need to help track where it comes from, uh, do some quality control on it, also, check that there are no duplications in, or as, as, as best we can, there are no duplications in the data streams, and then forward those data to the U.S. three times a week. So it's a pretty um, operational kind of uh, um, procedures in, in Canada. And then once it hits the, uh, the CMD, and there's a little picture later on about what they do in the U.S., that, so I'll delay talking about that. And then there, the data are shipped out to the data product centers. I should say, if there's any questions while I'm talking, just raise your hand, interrupt, do something so that we can answer them right away. So, global telecommunication system, I'm ahead of myself, but I didn't make the slides. Um, carries the real-time data from ships and buoys and floats and drifters and... Uh, whatever else uh, oceanographic that uh, can be put onto it. And the real-time and delayed centers, the continuously managed database. This is where the real-time data and the delayed mode data are put together. So effectively what happens, the real-time data arrives, say, within 24 hours. We'll take Argo floats as an example. They typically arrive within 24 hours of the float surfacing comes to Canada, we do the work on it, two days later or so, the data end up at the US NODC. And then the delayed mode comes in on the order of uh, months, six months, about six months later or so after they, the uh, researchers have done uh, some high quality, quality control on it to make sure that the, the profiles are good. And then the US NODC has to match that real-time profile 
which comes in with an identifier that says it's an Argo float, with the delayed mode that comes in with an identifier. Fortunately, these two identifiers are the same. But if you talk about ship data, it comes in, there's a ship in the Canadian fleet called the uh, Hudson. Its name in the real-time system is uh, CGDG. That's how it's identified in the real-time stream. And in the delayed mode stream, it's called HU. And what happens when people do the delayed mode QC, they may find, oh, well, the clock on the, uh, the ship wasn't functioning correctly or on the computer that logged the data. So they have to make a correction there. And or the positioning wasn't quite right, so there's some corrections there. And there's some things done to the data to clean it up and so on. So the real-time profile that we get is not exactly the same, nor is it located in exactly the same position necessarily at exactly the same time. So the duplicates problem becomes a little more complicated. And so the way we do the duplicates uh, is, uh, well, there's two ways. And one is a classical method that I guess I'll describe a bit later. And one is a newer one. So that's the job that, that the US NODC has, is to match these two different data streams when they come together, to know that this real-time profile and that delayed mode profile are really the same ones, even though they look a little different. Yes? Oh, uh so does it mean that at the end we still maintain both delayed mode and real-time mode? That's right, but the delayed or the real-time is is uh, flagged as a duplicate. Okay. So it's kept in the archive, but it's noted as being a duplicate profile. In what, in what instance that we can use the real-time mode? If, if, if sometimes the, the delayed mode. Mo yeah, sometimes the delayed mode data never get to the archive for whatever reason. So there'll be real-time profiles in the archive today that are 10 years old because we never got the delayed mode. The, the, whoever was collecting the data didn't send it into, the, uh, into any of the contributing NODCs. So that's a failing, but at least we have the real-time profile. And then the US does, has a lot of procedures to distribute data onto the web through CD-ROM and other ways. You'll see another one. The Data Product Center uh, performs analyses on the GTSPP data in the region of interest. And at this point in time for Japan, it's the North Pacific. And again, uses different procedures to examine the data. Sometimes turns up uh, problems, errors, uncertainties in the data that we missed in the previous QC uh, exercises. And then provides the feedback um, to either the collectors, certainly to the database, so that we can improve the quality of that database. And there's a lot of feedback, in fact, that goes on. So in the real-time center, if we see some peculiar things in formatting, for example, of a real-time data stream message, we'll go back, if we can identify where it came from, we'll go back to those folks and say, look, at, we saw a problem. Can you check at your end and see if you can fix it? for the next time around. Also happens through the data, the real time, and the delayed mode data streams as well. OK, so just a quick overview of the data flow, how it works. So there's a collectors, typically all of the ones at sea. And then there's who they relay the data into the GTS centers, the meteorological centers, um, either they can send it to their, their one in their own country. If they're a ship in the Pacific Ocean and their home country is the UK, they might send it through um, uh, a local radio station in Australia, for example. There are all these arrangements made between the different countries within the WMO to take data from ships and platforms at sea when it comes to them and to package it up and put it onto the GTS. And the data are bundled up in things called bulletins. And bulletins are just a collection of, think of it as a collection of uh, data from different, pro different stations in a, uh, do you know what stations are? Is that a familiar term for everybody in oceanography? Is anyone doesn't, is not familiar with that term? Good. Okay, so they, 
each station is reported and you can have one per bulletin or you can have a thousand in a bulletin. Um, and it's just a way to bundle things up and a header is put on as to when it went on the GTS, which center put it on, and, uh, and a routing of the, where these, uh, these, these uh, bundles should go. And so they come to the, um, some of the data have come to us directly from the data collectors. So we had an arrangement, for example, with one country where they were having problems making connections to their own meteorological center. So they sent the data to us by email. We did some work on it, packaged it up, and inserted it onto the GTS through our MET center. The real, the best route should be to go through a MET center directly and not through Canada. But we were being flexible, wanted to help out. Until they could get the other arrangements sorted out, we did it this way. Mostly it comes to the GTS centers, to the real-time assembly center in Canada, and there are some operational clients. And I'd mentioned the ECMWF is one, Coriolis is another. Um, can't remember now. There were about six to ten different clients who wanted the da data as soon as um, we were able to deliver it. The advantage of, for them of getting it from us is that we capture all of the data that's on the GTS from the whole world. We, I say Canada, I'm speaking we. Brings all the data together into one place, consolidates into one data distribution format, goes through a common set of quality control routines, and then we send it out to people. So they don't have to figure out how to read messages on the GTS, for example, which is a completely different format issue. So there's, it's, it's convenient for people who want access to the real-time data to go to Canada and say, can I be on your distribution list as well? Or if you can wait a few days, you can get it from the US NODC because the updates happen, as I say, three times a week. And then that's when the, we deliver the data to the US NODC. And they also have operational clients and clients who come in from time to time to download data, as you'll see later. There's also delayed mode processing that goes on in the various research or organizations that collect the data. And they'll send it in a matter of days or years, sometimes never, <laughs> to the continuously managed database in the US. So that's the delayed mode route is along, the, uh, along this, this part of the program, of uh, the uh, slide. Real time comes here. And as I said, the union of those two takes place in the U.S. Uh, Bob, yes. Uh, the, the one, the delayed mode, yes. is processed by the owner of the equipment? Or? Yes, that's right. It would be the, in, in, um, in the U.S., for example, Scripps runs some of the, the, their programs on the um, ship of opportunity lines. So they collect the XBTs. Those go in through the real-time system. But they also look at the and do their own quality control processing and then send that on to the US NODC. And equivalent from other countries and other organizations. I have another question on, on the data uh, format. Uh, I guess that uh, with the uh, SBT, they already have their own, uh, you know, like, like you said earlier, uh, they set up a, a very specific uh, format. That can be now nowadays. I, I guess that you know most of the geography in the world are very familiar with with that format. So that does does that format is actually uh, being used for different purpose of, of machine learning data as well, in, other than uh, with well, the Well, the the format that we set up was intended originally for just the internal communications of the project, of the people. So between ourselves and the US NODC and the research groups who were doing the scientific QC for us. So originally it was just for that purpose. But in fact, other people have started to have used it as well. And there's a, um, the format was set up as a binary format. But uh, there's a translation to ASCII, which you'll, you'll have a look at later today. 
And some people have actually used that ASCII format as well. So it's got wider distribution than the original intent. Um, the original idea was people would go to the uh, NODC uh, in the US and they would download in different formats that they might need. And nowadays NetCDF is one that's becoming more popular. But you can still get an ASCII form of GTSPP. It, it, yeah, it might be. Right now, uh, the ASCII form of, of GTSPP, I mean, it was invented 25 years ago, and it has a few weaknesses that have turned up over the years. NetCDF contains all of the same information and does not have those same weaknesses. So if someone were wanting to take GTSPP data, I would suggest they use NetCDF, not the GTSPP ASCII form. As I say, originally it was just for internal use, and it was invented. It has legacy issues because of the system that it was invented to run on, and uh, those, those issues have gone away if you use a more modern data format. So, very complicated. This is how things work in the US. And uh, it's hard to see all the, uh, oh, I guess it's not too bad. But anyway, there's, um, I'll let, I'm not going to go into a lot of the details because it's just, it's very complicated. But it, the real-time data come in through this, this little, well, let's see, is this, oh, sorry. Is it, no just checking to see if there are little highlights of the slides. So the real-time data come in through this stream here, and the delayed come through this stream. And the delayed have to go through a format conversion because almost all the time when someone sends data to a data center, it's in their own format as opposed to a, data, a format that the data center wants. And the reason that is is if a data center insists on getting data in a particular format, they won't get data at all. So you have to be really flexible about it. So there's a reformatting that takes place here to the GTSPP data structures. And then it goes into uh, a file that, that uh, I guess, computes some statistics. This is a process more familiar to uh, Charles and to me. Um, a little process that tests the format to make sure that things were translated correctly. Uh, goes through a check of whether the codes that are embedded in that file, the vocabularies, if you will, uh, conform to what is expected. And then um, identified whether it is a real-time or delayed mode profile. So this checks whether the call sign or the platform code that's used. So remember, call sign is the real-time side. Platform code is the delayed mode side. Make sure that those are uh, those are known. So it goes through a little checker like that, loads into the database, does some QC with editing, uh, splits up for NODC. It splits it up into a cruise, um, goes through a duplicates checker here, and. That that has to, as I say, identify not only if there is duplicates within a single file coming. So within a cruise, uh, sometimes you'll have duplicates that occur, and sometimes there are duplicates or near duplicates with the real-time side as well. So you have to look for both. So it goes through that, and then eventually ends up into the uh, update the, the database. So you don't really have to know all of the mechanics necessarily, but those are the kinds of processing steps that go on. Um, so there's the acquisition, there's an accession, basically uh, you, the NODC puts a stamp on it, says I received this data file on this date, and puts that away as the original data that came to it. So if it has to, it can go back and look at that for one reason or another. The data go through uh, uh, an ingestion process, a quality assessment, and then into the database. Um, I've already talked about this is what happens in the in Canada 
uh, the work that goes on. The, this is the accession system within the NODC. Um, essentially, as I said, just puts a timestamp and identifier on it and preserves the data for the next, uh, in, in case it needs to be looked at later. So there's a series of steps in the ingestion and uh, format conversion, consistency, authority tables. We kind of went through this in the little diagram. And there's a load. Now they use they actually use a, a relational database system. In Canada, it's uh, the system we use is a precursor to a <laughs> to a relational database system. It looks like a relational system, but it isn't. Um, Anyway, it goes into there. They do some duplicate checking, uh, resolution of issues that come up, uh, and uh, and so on. Okay, in the uh, the quality steps, and there'll be a little more detail on this later in another uh, another slide. Um, this happens. The first, you look for duplicates, and the classical way was to look at date and time and position. So in GTSPP, we chose an arbitrary way of, of identifying potential duplicates. So we said if two stations are within, um, what is it? It's 15 minutes of each other in time. And what's the? Five kilometers of, of space. Then it may be a duplicate. So we don't actually, at this stage, we don't actually look at the data. We just bring together all of those stations that are within 5 kilometers in 15 minutes. And we say, these are possible duplicates. And then we look at the, the ship identifier or the platform identifier to see if there are any matches. And if there are matches, then we say, OK, that's, that looks like it might be. If it doesn't match, it doesn't mean it isn't. It just means that the some of the evidence is missing. And then we look at the profile, and we say, do these profiles look the same? And sometimes they look the same, and sometimes they're a little bit different. And sometimes resolving whether they're a duplicate station or not is not easy. Um, and generally, you try to be conservative in the sense that if it looks like it might be a different platform, uh, that made a measurement in that time space window, then you would leave it in the database as a separate station. Often it's easy enough to tell that one profile between delayed and real time, for example, the delayed has many more depths, real time has fewer, and there'll be a spike or something in the real time that's gone on a delayed mode, but most of the values line up almost identically. Then you're pretty sure it's a uh, and if the ship identifier, platform identifier match up, you're pretty sure it's a duplicate and you would label the, uh, the real time as a duplicate. But it's not always so clear. The point is we want to remove, well, we want to identify those profiles, those stations that come to the process as being duplicates so that people don't think they're getting 400 stations when really there's only 350 that are unique. So then it goes through a review process. So a series of tests are performed on the data. You'll see some details about that later. And, and it goes through and presents the data to the screen. And there are some examples here. So uh, this screen down here is a cruise track. So it just shows where the platform was at successive times. And you can look for uh, whether there are uh, unusual speeds or so on happening between the various stations. This one, you look at the actual profile itself to see if it falls within climatology, has some unusual features, those kinds of things. And then this is a way to look at whether the profile is reporting data deeper than the ocean at that location to within the resolution of your bathymetry file and also to look at how it matches to climatologies that you might be using. Before Bob, let me make one comment on the previous tool. 
n l b c เป็นทุกอาวุธบอกบอกครับเป็นเลยที่สุดจากจากการโปรเจกต์ของเราก็จะ n l b c ที่เป็นเว็บไซต์เดียร์เซ็ตลิงก์ allow you to download the software the software written in IPA is able to take advantage in the taking of training how to use that that you say it's relatively easy to use it's like a visual So the different data types. So this is a picture that uh, JCOM produces of the various data types that are uh, part of their observation system. And uh, you don't have to worry about the satellite picture. We don't deal in satellite data at all. But this is an Argo float. And there's a dummy version sitting out in the hall there, a big yellow uh, cylinder. Uh, surface drifter. Occasionally, surface drifters have thermistor chains or uh, conductivity uh, uh, measurements on a chain below them, so those data enter the GTSPP. Um, down here is the like the uh, equatorial moorings. This is a tau boy. Again, those have uh, typically have thermistor chains below them, and they report uh, hourly, typically. In fact, up here this would be um, well. This is part of uh, um, tide gauge installation. Got nothing to do with us. Um, but it's part of JCOM. Um, this one, uh, where's, uh, I did something bad. <sighs> Hang on. No, 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 no. Where are we here? Go back. What slide? Oh, here we are. I'll go back one. There we are. So the uh, this picture here, I think is I'm not sure. I not sure what that is. Uh, this one here on the on the left or right. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's uh. It's the ocean sites. Ocean. Okay, ocean sites yeah, mooring. Serious station. Right, right. Uh, and then this one here. Those are the ships of opportunity, and this would be for the uh, volunteer observing ships, which is the surface mat observations. So we typically don't deal in the surface mat ocean because they typically only collect uh, sea surface temperature. And for the GTSPP, we need at least two points in a profile before we'll consider it for our uh, archive. Ah, here we are. There. Uh, profiling floats. So this is an example of just one of the data streams. There's uh, actually more than 3,000 drifters in the ocean. They try to deploy them so that there are there is at least one collected uh, profile every 10 days in every 10 by 10 uh, uh, degree square of the world. So it sounds like a lot, but in fact, when you think a 10 degree square is like about a thousand kilometers square, uh, it's not not such a, a high density of observations. Nevertheless, you can see that uh, in the 2013 uh, map, depending on the size of your spots, you fill up the ocean pretty well. And in fact, the amount of data that's come into the global archives from Argo, in fact, exceeds the total of all the data that's been collected in all times before that. So from 2000 to present, we have more data from that decade on than we've ever had counting everything else in the oceanographic profile archives. Uh, drifting buoys, these show the ones that have thermistor chains only. The drifting buoy network has uh, many more uh, buoys that, that operate, but these ones, are the example shown here, is the ones that actually have thermistor chains. So you see they, uh, they're in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, moorings there, or uh, drifters there, uh, up in European waters, and then off of uh, Asia here. So all of these end up in the GTSVP. Here's the fixed boy locations. Again, you can see the tropical moorings. There also is a lot of there are a lot of uh, boys moorings up in the uh, European regions, uh, in the Canadian waters as well. There's more that go up the coast, and some of those will have their Mister Chains. Not so many. And then, well, yeah, you can see it on the 2013 slide here. So there's a coastal moorings that the U.S. puts in. And here, there are a few up on the Canadian coast. Uh, 
more, I guess that's, it's hard to tell, but I guess that's the Black Sea. Um, these are the, the ship of opportunity, or XBT, so this is the ship of opportunity, and you can see the, uh, the various ship lines that are shown there. So these are, most of them are merchant vessels that have been recruited to take XBT observations. They're given a, a, a box or two or three of XBTs. Does everyone know what an XBT looks like? No one? Some people don't know? Good. There's an example in the other room. I'll bring it in. I'll show you what it is. It's a device you throw over the side of the ship. The X stands for expendable. So it goes through over the side of the ship, makes a temperature profile, and uh, the wire breaks and it falls to the bottom of the ocean. They cost anywhere between fifty to a hundred dollars U.S. each, um, and they're right now. I think, if I remember correctly, in two thousand and thirteen, there were thirty thousand, or no, that's high, fifteen thousand deployed in the world oceans. In any event, the ships do it along particular lines that they try to repeat, so that they can measure. Um, uh, heat content in the upper ocean uh, and uh, mesoscale eddies and things like that in, in the oceanography. And again, they almost all of those ships are uh, wired into the Inmarsat system, transmit the data ashore uh, shortly after they're collected, ends up on the GTS, comes into GTSVP. Marine mammals, uh, I don't know if you're aware, certain marine mammals, they... Um, they uh, are installed with a small CTD sensor on them. So they, they actually glue it to their fur on their heads. So it doesn't actually touch the skin. It's just on the fur. And these things, these animals shed their fur, mold their fur every year. So these, the, the CTDs drop off. But in any event, so when these things dive, it records temperature and salinity as deep as they go. When it comes to the surface, the uh, uh, data, uh, a data message is sent through uh, satellites, and so we get a bunch of those as well. These things, these things, I shouldn't say that. They're, they're uh, elephant seals or other kinds of seals, and some of them dive. Elephant seals, for example, some dive as deep, almost as 2,000 meters. So that's pretty impressive. And when they come up, this data stream comes from them and uh, goes into the GTS, and so they're also represented. And the nice thing about using marine mammals is they go places where ships don't often go. So for example, all of this down in the uh, Antarctic waters, ships don't like to go there, partly because of ice, partly rough seas. But for marine mammals, they're happy there because that's where the food is. And they don't mind operating in ice. And again, in the uh, Arctic uh, northern, northern waters uh, up here, and they're quite, they're quite remarkable animals. Uh, the seals, some of the elephant seals are tagged on a little island. Uh, where is my cursor gone? There's a little island here in the, in the uh, southern Indian uh, where the researchers go, and the seals have come ashore to, uh, for, to breed. And they capture them and give them a nice little hat at that time and send them off. And these things swim throughout the Arctic Ocean. They swim thousands of kilometers. We did an exercise off of Canada where we uh, instrumented 10 seals. Um, no, about 20 seals. And they're three different species. One of them stayed really close to home off of Newfoundland, which is up here. Another set went north up into uh, the Labrador Sea area up in here. Another one swam across to Iceland and spent time in Iceland before swimming back to Canada. And over the course of um, these things last, I think the battery dies after three or four or five months. So in a, in a half year period, they swim across Iceland and back. So that's another and a kind of unique data set that uh, really is, is helpful. Data volume. So this is the kind of the number of stations by year that's in the, um, the um, 
uh, GTSPP archive. And what you see here is a count. There are things called bathies and another called TSACs. And those are formats, essentially format designators that are used in the real-time data stream. So bathies are just temperature profiles. And TSACs are both temperature and salinity. And so you can see that um, the numbers were quite low until about 2000. This is when Argo started. And now you can see the growth in the number of profiles. A lot of that is Argo. Some of it is, um, is also some moorings, but mostly it's Argo. And then this is the number of stations within the, the continuously managed database in the NODC the mix of instrumentation, if you will, that's used to uh, um, use these days. And so you can see in the early days uh, there were bottle stations. People still use oceanographic bottles, but mostly it's to calibrate CTDs. So there's only a few that are used to collect a water sample, maybe top and bottom of a CTD profile, and not every one. So your number of bottles that are actually reporting to uh, in GTSPP is, is uh, decreasing, as you can see. It's only a very small fraction. CTDs are relatively small. Um, there's a few in the later years. The fact that you don't see any in the most recent years is because it takes a long time for CTD data to get into the global archives. The researchers collect it. Some of them have arrangements where they get to keep the data for two years so they can write research papers on it and not be worried that someone else will use their data to, to uh, uh, do some other research that they thought they should do. So the data are withheld, and, and here you can see the impact of that. Yellow is the XBTs, and you can see that from the early 1990s to present, the number of XBTs that are being reported are, are, uh, are also diminished. And that's partly because they changed the mode of operation uh, of the XBT deployments in the Ship of Opportunity program. And then, of course, the profiling floats that started, really started in 2000. It, they were experimental instruments used in the WOS program in the, in the early 1990s. So data delivery, there's online, there's offline, and there's a user request system. Um, if you want to go to the US NODC, here are the sites. You'll see the web server, and, and in fact, that'll be part of the exercise that we'll get to shortly. Um, you can go to the FTP server, and in fact, that's what you did yesterday when you downloaded that Indian Ocean file. If you just type in this FTP address that you see here uh, to your browser, you'll see the, uh, the GTSPP and embedded uh, folders. So you'll see GTSPP, you'll see the different oceans available. Within an ocean you'll see the various years available. Within each year you'll see the months that are available, which is what essentially what you did yesterday. There's also a server, an OpenDAP server. If OpenDAP is just another uh, distribution system, if you're not familiar with it, um, there's uh, um, it's just another way to allow you to um, combine data from different sites but only for a particular area of interest to you. And the thread server again is another kind of server of data depending on what you're after. So here's the, uh, the uh, uh, NODC website. I'm going to go quickly through this. In the last half hour or so we'll do the demonstration and you can, uh, we can play with it a bit. So it allows you to do, this is the page, it allows you to select by a lat long range, either in a text box, which is uh, shown, where's my mouse? Here, shown in this part. Or you can do a little rubber band where you click and drag on a map of the world. Um, there's also, you can select by uh, an ocean area that's been prepackaged uh, for you as well. And then the date range. The GTSPP archives start in 1990 and go to present. Um, but I expect you can get older data than that if you want in the uh, GTSPP uh, format, if nothing else. 
Uh, there's seasonal filters, there's whether you want real-time, delayed mode. Best copy is the one that we uh, encourage people to get because that's a mix of the real-time and delayed mode. So if you say, I want the data today, uh, the best copy version today of a particular ocean and time, for example, and then you go in a week later and do a best copy, chances are you'll get a different collection of data. There'll be some new real-time profiles that arrived. There may have been some delayed mode that got processed in the meantime and deleted, well, effectively removed from your, your uh, file the real time that they were to replace. And so it'll be a different mix of data. Um, and then you can choose uh, different data types if you want all the kinds that you can get it. If you just want to select a particular data type, there's a selection of that. And you can get different kinds of products. Um, yeah, this is the FTP server that I, that I explained uh, just before. The, we talked about the wget, you saw that yesterday. Uh, there's the example. You'll all have, if you haven't downloaded, I guess you you have access to these slides. I encourage you to download them. It has lots of good URLs and examples in them. Uh, user defined. The DVD is also available. There, it's stored in that CDF, sorted by year and month, then compressed. It's about 14 gigabytes in uh, on the DVD so far. Um, there are meeting report documents if you want to go back and see some of the uh, discussions that took place. And it's all written in this ISO 9660 format, so it uh, can be read on virtually any kinds of any, uh, computer. Um, data distribution schedules, so the real-time data sets in, come in in GTSPP ASCII, which I'll burden you with later. <laughs> And that's three times a week, available if you want it. So that's just the preliminary QC and duplicates checking. Um, you can get it in uh, NetCDF or a spreadsheet format once a week from the US NODC. So every week this, this is available. Or you can get the best copy data sets uh, once a month. And if there are emergencies, for example, like the Deepwater Horizon problems that they had in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, special um, situations can be set up to help uh, provide the data as quickly as possible to those kinds of situations. Um, so, I think I'll let Charles take it from here. If there are any questions, you can talk to me at coffee. You're going to do it from there or from here, Charles? Um, let me copy one more slide about the data distribution schedule. I'd like to point out there's a new format available using the, we call the spreadsheet format. The spreadsheet format just made available maybe uh, I think three weeks ago, just for just for this this course. Okay, it's it's a fully ocean data view compatible. It's a spreadsheet. Okay, and that's one other exercise we're going to do uh, I on Thursday, either tomorrow or Thursday. Okay, so so right now, open your browser and go to NLDish website, which is shown on the screen on the TV monitor. There is a, it's some kind of people call a security issue about using Java applet. Java applet is has been used almost more than ten years ago. So when you open your browser, go to NLDC, okay, www.nldc.nova.go, okay, then go all the way up to here. Oh, no, it won't allow me to do that. Okay, and stop. Go all the way up to here and enter uppercase GTSPP. So that will take you to GTAPP uh, web page. Okay. Now on the left, that you will see on the screen, on the TV screen. 
So everybody was there. And it, all the way up to here, and out of that I said GTAPP uppercase and slash. That will take you to actually one, one more step up. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. And, and there's an issue. People complain about Java effort. Not long time ago. So, so you click on the left hand, on the menu, on the left hand side, say user defined data set. And that will take you to the CTI page. Now, so this is my, my PC, and I've been working on that PC for, for, for a while. So I know the way to get around with the security issues and most of the people, everybody's desktop, okay? The map on the screen, and you, you, don't, you cannot see the map on your desktop because uh, I try to, um, set out a security issue, but I cannot do that for some reason, because I just saw that for me, maybe I'm not as authorized to do that for, uh, for the Office PC. So, so that's okay. But I, I, I'd like you to address, the, actually it's not a security issue. There's no, to me, I love that Java applet. No, I, I don't see there's any harm to your PC at all, so I'm still using it. And I say, I like it. Uh, I, I make that applet, maybe more than 10 years ago. So I call IMAP. Even before Steve Jobs created I, iPhone. <laughs> so I call IMAP. But that time, I not means internet. I, I means interactive. So a lot of users can interact with the map. So I create that map. So the map is a global map, but repeat almost uh, one third on the right hand side. So it's, it's larger. So the idea for doing that is to allow you to not just across the international ten line. No. So most likely you will see people make map, the global map, and you can across international ten line. The center is over the Greenwich. Also, you can across international ten line. No. There's, there's one application at NLDC. I'm not going to mention the name. No. That's no, it's not useful. You, you cannot select your data across Ocean boundary. I said that that, that, that's, that map is useless. So page design allow you to across any ocean boundary, Pacific, India, or Indian Ocean, and and the uh, Atlantic Ocean, or uh, anyway. So so I'm actually I'm very proud of that I map. So that's one of the reasons I keep using it, and there's no 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 harm to my PC. So so what I like to do since the job applet is disabled on everybody's desktop, so, so just forget it. But I like you, you should know, I like you to practice using GWI, which stands for uh, GTAPP web interface, to select the area of your interest. So you should know your area of interest. By doing that, you can enter your, the boundary on the text box you see on the screen, right? I, I can show one from here. Okay, I'm going to uh, 
w w w n o d c n o a a g o v s l a s h u p p e r c a s e g t h p p When you type a browser, this is the area that the case sensitive. Got to type exactly the same. The same. Otherwise, you you won't get there. However, at the NODC, we make a symbolic link to the lower case. So either you type upper case, lower case, no, it doesn't. It always go to the same location. Okay, I just use it's a lower case, but it doesn't matter. Okay. So on the left hand side, you click user define data set. Now it will take you to another. Can you look on 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 the uh, on the menu bar here? You see CGI. Okay, but in this case, the even say active Java applet. I never try on Macintosh. Let me try. This is my first time try to use this application on on Mac. Okay, and allow and then remember. I don't say they will allow me to do that. So it doesn't happen. Oh, it's going. Good news. Yeah, I think this still a uh, oh here we are. That's good. That's nice. Oh, thank you to IOD. <laughs> okay, so 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 the map you can repeat. You can see on the right hand side near the right edge. This is repeat of this portion. The India IOD was to repeat two times on the map, and this map is designed to give you a rough idea. You no, know, uh, the boundary you are interested in. Okay, so it allow you to point. And then drag, and then release. There will be the uh, area. Say, in, for example, in this case near the uh, Eastern Pacific Ocean. And after that, you say, okay, this area I'm interested. In. Okay. Suppose it should be go to that box, and for some reason it didn't didn't go there. But that's okay. Uh, So the first time, the first step you have to do is select the spatial range, say the area which you like. Okay, uh, let's pick out say somewhere in the Hawaii. For, for example, I, I know that because I was there. Uh, this say uh, this is roughly um, put a small area, thirty degree north, and you can select the area of, of your interest in the twenty degree south. It's so roughly let's put um. On the western boundary, let's say this is going to be one. Let's say one one fifty to. No, it should it should be one one. Put one sixty to my left and one fifty to my to to the right. So so negative indicate the uh western no longitude and positive is well, eastern longitude. Okay, so the first day you select the spatial range. The area that you are interested, in. okay, and the next time, the next, or you can select either Atlantic Ocean or Pacific Ocean or India Ocean. This is predefined. The boundary for each ocean you can check a GDPP user menu, and I forgot to mention that the data user menu is available on the training site. Okay. Now you the step two, you specify the data depth range, the area of interest. In this case, you can and you can select from the pull down menu, or just enter your date, year, date, enter the uh, text area. So let's just pick up. Say for looking for near real time, it will be twenty fourteen. Uh, let's just say today is pick up June, June one to maybe say up to yesterday. Not yesterday, maybe two days before yesterday. They put out June one, June first, June June thirty. So this indicates what you have so far, and it was two twenty fourteen. Okay. So so this we specify the spe uh, temporal range is from June first to June thirty this year. Or or the, or you can specify the seasonal. You say. Every which month for every year, say every January for this year, and you can specify best copy for real time. But in this case, there's no delay mode data, so there's no no difference between best copy 
and the real time. Bob already explained to you what's the definition of basic copy. The definition of basic copy is the replacement of the real time by the demo data of the real time message. Okay, so right now either basic copy or real time, it doesn't matter. According to the time range we select earlier, At the next one we'll just select the data type. You know, we have actually basically this instrument type, and then you, you can select what kind of instrument type. And this is a little bit confusing. I realize once, once after we create the web page, if you select, to, for example, TA, which means TSEC, or BA, that, that's a real time. Okay. If you set other data type, most likely they are the dilemma data. Okay. It's very difficult to, to define what's the real time data of the CTD only. We have been trying really hard, and we still cannot figure out. Uh, the way to sort or allow users to select the real-time CTD or real-time XBT. XBT, we know how to handle that now, but the other data type may be a difficulty to do that because the way that data coming from GTS and the only, most likely, they are different instruments. They are only sharing the TSEC, for example. So, so it's, it's not easy to sort out, but we, we are still working on it right now. Okay. Or you can select platform code. You, you know the platform code, or you can call it oh, call sign. You should be able to, to get it. Okay. And then let the step number seven, you select the products. Okay. Either just display the SQL statement as an option number one, or you can just say, display only the count. Like, after I select criteria, is there any data in the range I'm interested in? So I said, I would suggest this is the first step. Just look how many data meet my selection criteria. Right now, we specify the data uh, located near the Hawaiian Islands, which is the time range from June 1st to June 30, 2014. So keep that in mind. And we try to see, take a look at uh, how many stations, how many observations we have in the area over June 1st, this month. So as I said earlier, no, you want to embarrass someone and encourage this person to give a live demo. So I'm going to show that live demo, but I, have, I keep my finger crossed. As you mean, I, I'm not sure that the system work until I see it work. Okay, so give them a try. Say submit. So this will display the count. Okay, the first time they display the spatial range is from 20 degree to 30, to 30 degree north and uh, 160 east to 150 east. Okay, uh, it's, still, it's still working. So there's no data for some reason. There's, there's, it return, there's no deep count equal to zero. So, so in that case, we have to, let me try to another way. Let me try to say base copy. And replace base copy by real time, you see. Let's copy some data there. Okay, pick up real time data. Your southern, the southern latitude that you said was 20, not, did you want minus 20? No, southern is southern most. It doesn't mean southern hemisphere. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, so this is 20 degree north. Okay, so this is a 10 by 10 degree square. Yeah, it's only 10, 10 by 10, maybe, maybe too, too small. Let's increase a little bit to this, uh, run, run 10. Yeah, okay, put down to zero. And I put this to say, no, increase this is to, to say 45. And uh, this is, uh, um, okay, let's, let's, let's yeah. increase it to maybe 140, to, to increase the range. Do you have okay. to reset the dates the second time? No, it's there. Okay. So just see what we have for this month. And this is submit. Is that no? Okay. Okay, now I. Why don't you, uh, you have, Charles, in the uh, data types, you 
selected just batteries. Right? Why don't you select? Oh, okay. Batteries? Maybe just say, oh, you are right. Okay. Yeah, data take equal to O. Okay, we got 1,000 and the 74 station. We have, so we can go ahead to download. So the next step, so we know the assumption. Probably. I said, try to, when I ask you to do, to do the area of interest, try to name the number of stations around 1,000. Okay, just, just for the, for the, for the demo purpose, don't don't get too big, because when next day, next day we're going to load into GTPP, uh, load into ODV, on the PC version of the ODV is is relative slow, so so for this purpose I like you to select the station, the total number on all the thousand, you now maybe less than maybe seven hundred or eight hundred, so so if you are wrong to that one, so so next step. I'm going to retrieve the data. Okay, you say HTML, I will just show on your screen only. Or you prepare a data for download, and that's the way I suggest. Say prepare data for download. But data you download will be in, in MetaSQL and, and compressed. Okay, so so let's limit the number. Okay, I think it's also still okay. So, so right now I'm going to retrieve the data and the display in HTML and see how it looks like. Okay, so the date, the, what you see on the screen is a data in made ASCII format. Okay, begin with the first column we call the M key, the master key. It's the counting of how many lines in the in the data file which you just retrieve. And the, the starting file will write the second portion of, of the spreadsheet. And it, so, so next session we're going to talk about uh, the format or the ASCII format. Okay. So I will leave you to uh, do the exercise, retrieve the area of your, or your interest and the save the data Okay, let me show you. When you, when you pick out the second, the very last option, prepare data for download, and I will let you do that. You say submit, and the system will bundle everything together into one single table, the, top, the compressed file. Okay, so you can select either the, the plan, the not zipped. The first option will be made as key, take only, or zipped. Okay. Uh, for this class purpose, I would suggest that using MetaSQL text so that and zip is relatively big, but that's okay. You know, normally, I pick out uh, MetaSQL zip, the, the second option, which which will transfer faster, and I can unzip later on. But I'm not sure that the, the desktop you are using right now has unzip uh, uh, software. So I suggest we pick out the MetaSQL you know, text file. Okay. Now either either Windows version of the format or, or Linux, it doesn't matter at all. And if you say submit, they will ask you to save the file to a location. Okay, see? So so I don't want to open that. I don't want to open this file. But I want to save. When I say save, suppose they should ask me to save a location. It looks like you are going to save to the download the default uh, the directory for the, uh, of the browser, and most likely it will be in download. So after you download the file, I would suggest you move the file you just retrieved into GTAP, G-Training, start from your desktop, G-Training, and the data directory. You don't have the data directory and your G-Training on your desktop, which you have on your Linux server, but right now we're going to use the, uh, the Windows version of the R, right? So I would suggest once you download to your download directory, move that file to G Training and the data. Okay, so you don't have data directory and the G Training create one. Okay, so so I will stop here and let you do your home exercise. You finished. We can take coffee break, but we will be back maybe 
uh, I, I give more extra time. No. So be back at 11. So after maybe five minutes earlier, say, no, uh, 5 to 11, so I will walk through everyone, make sure everyone has the file downloaded into uh, your local uh, disk, disk. Okay? So so I stop here, and everybody, and I can walk with everyone. You have a problem. Okay.